Well, um, I wonder whether you could tell me if you recognise who this man is. Was the boss of Dulux ICI? That's right. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So John Harvey Jones. So John Harvey Jones. Yeah, yeah. So John Harvey. Yeah. So he died a few years ago, 1924 to 2008, and yeah, he was a British uh, industrialist. Well, in the early uh, 1990s. The BBC uh, broadcast a series called The Troubleshooter, in which the John would spend a, a few days with some UK companies, getting to know their business, studying their balance sheets, and then he would speak to the management about his recommendations for the way forward. And one of the first companies he visited was Apricot Computers. Looks dinosaur age now, doesn't it? That that PC. And uh, now Apricot Computers had two sides to its business: the hardware side, at the manufacture of PCs, and the the software side. And so John, looking at the figures, he made the the radical proposal that Apricot should sell off the manufacturing part of the business and concentrate on the software side. Well, when the managing director heard this, he was aghast and he protested. But John, Sir John replied, business is often about killing your favourite children to allow others to succeed. Killing your favourite children to allow others to succeed. You know, those words came to me when thinking about this passage in Genesis 22. Abraham receives the call of God to kill off his favourite child, Isaac. And we've come this evening then to the ultimate episode in Abraham's amazing journey of faith. And I've entitled tonight's sermon, Yahweh Yaira, the Lord will provide. Now this is a, a, a rich passage. And we see here, don't we, a clear example of the principle of salvation by substitute being enacted. But perhaps the, the more immediate teaching point of the text is to show us how obedient faith overcomes in the trials of life. I've got four headings for us to examine the text with. Firstly, let's consider in verse 2 the test which Abraham must have found shocking. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Now the fact that we're told in verse one that God was testing Abraham serves to cushion us, doesn't it, from the, the, the shock of what is to follow in verse two. Abraham is called upon by the Lord to do something which is at odds with both common sense and with the divine promise. Common sense, as much as human decency, says you don't commit infanticide if you want to create a dynasty. And the divine promise had said that it would be through Isaac that Abraham's offspring would be reckoned. We have that in the preceding chapter, verse 12 of chapter 21. Furthermore, the command Abraham had been given contradicted the character of the God that Abraham had come to know as a friend. Child's sacrifice was a, a trait of the godless Canaanites. Surely such a practice was repugnant to the holy God of Abraham. Now in the, the, the previous 10 chapters, documenting Abraham's amazing journey of faith, he's been presented with many tests, not all of which he had passed, but some of which he'd failed. He failed, for instance, the test of famine in chapter 12, and he goes to Egypt to escape it, and he promptly passes off Sarah as his sister and not as his wife in order to save his own skin from Pharaoh. The fear of men test, he was to fail yet again in chapter 20, when he commits the same deception, and King Abimelech unwittingly takes Sarah into his harem. 
Abraham had failed the patience test. In chapter 16, when at Sarah's behest, he sleeps with her maidservant Hagar, and she bears him a son, Ishmael, to be the heir Sarah had been able, unable to give him. But there were also some tests of faith which Abraham had passed, notably in chapter 21, when Abraham, despite his distress, sends out his son Ishmael into the desert with relatively few provisions and entrusts his eldest son welfare to the Lord. So Abraham's journey of faith had not been without its ups and downs. It had been uneven, but the direction of travel had been in the right direction, one of ever greater faith in the God he conversed with as a friend. But now in verse 2, he's confronted with a test which made neither common nor theological sense. Now look at the, 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 the shocking nature of, of God's words to, to Abraham. The Lord emphasizes just how precious his son is to him. The Lord piles on the agony. Seemingly the, the Lord rubs salt into the wound. Take your son, not just your son, but your only son, now that he had been separated from Ishmael. But Isaac was not just Abraham's only son, but your only son whom you love. And then he is to sacrifice his only son, whom he loved, as a burnt offering on a mountain quite some distance away. Do you know what a sacrifice of a live being consisted of? It entailed slitting the throat of the victim, dismembering its body, and the complete consumption of the body parts into ashes by the fire ignited on the altar. It was too horrific to contemplate. It was too gruesome to imagine. But this was a task Abraham had been called upon to carry out upon not an animal, but his son. But his son. Sometimes we, we hear news reports of deranged people who go out and murder someone because they hear a voice in their head whom they claim to be God telling them to go out and do it. But this was not the case in verse 2. Abraham was in his right mind. And Abraham, by now, over the course of many years, had got to know the voice of God. The word of God had come to him on numerous occasions. It was unmistakable. He knew the word of God when he heard it. Abraham, then, was in no doubt. It was the Lord. It was the Lord. Now, we're not told how Abraham reacted when he heard this call. Presumably he was perplexed. Presumably he was in agony of soul. Presumably he shed tears. But remarkably, the very next morning, Abraham and his party of four, including Isaac, are up and at it and are on their way first thing to Moriah with a donkey load, loaded with sufficient wood for a burnt offering. The test which Abraham must have found shocking. What can we learn from it? Well, firstly, we need to learn there is a distinction between a test and a temptation. A, a temptation is used by the devil to bring out the worst in us, but a trial is used by God to bring out the best in us. Certain temptations, if, which if we habitually succumb to, well, they weaken us, don't they, morally. But tests, trials which we face with obedient faith, strengthen us spiritually. And here Abraham's faith was going to be subjected to the severest examination. But because he held firm, he's held, he's held faith is held up as being one of the greatest examples of faith in history. Listen to the Apostle James' verdict. James chapter 2. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. 
There is then a distinction between a test and a temptation. <coughs> but secondly, remember that your God is a jealous God. He wants the number one place in your life. He wants you to trust him above all things. And effectively by this test, he was saying to Abraham, is your confidence in your son or is it in me who has given you the son you thought that you would never have? By the shore of Galilee, the risen Lord Jesus said to the apostle Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And here in Genesis 22, God is asking that same question of Abraham as he asks of all his people. Do you love me more than these? Will you put obedience to my word above everything else? Our God is a jealous God and he wants the number one place in your life and mine. Well, the, the test which Abraham must have found shocking is followed next by, verse 7, the question which Abraham must have been dreading. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? When children ask about death, sex or something else that's difficult to explain parents instinctively feel uncomfortable they squirm don't they as if under a searchlight they try to give a non-answer and change the subject to a less awkward one this was the predicament abraham found himself in as he and isaac made their way slowly up the mountain now, biblical scholars believe that Moriah was about 45 miles away from Beersheba, which had become Abraham's home. Isaac then is now about 15 years old. And it's a perfectly natural question for a 15 year old to ask. Isaac had been around his father long enough to know what a sacrifice to the Lord entailed. Apart from the wood, there had to be an animal to sacrifice. It was normally a lamb, so where was the lamb? Isaac asked the question which pointed to the obvious. The sacrificial lamb was missing, so where was it? What could Abraham possibly say in response to such a question? Can you imagine the loneliness Abraham must have felt in that 72 hour journey to Moriah? Only he knew it was to be Isaac who was to be the lamb, not the two accompanying sermon, servants, not Sarah. He hadn't confided in Sarah. He couldn't possibly have confided in her. Can you imagine Sarah's reaction to such a proposition? She was the ultra protective tigress of Genesis 21 who could not tolerate the presence of Isaac's half brother Ishmael and so had insisted to her husband that this young lad be sent away. Had Abraham revealed to her what the Lord had called upon him to do, no doubt Sarah would have spirited Isaac away to safety like any rational mother would. So Abraham leaves the party of four, which becomes the party of two, near the place of sacrifice, keeping the brutal truth to himself. He could hardly reply to Isaac, well, actually, son, the Lord has revealed to me that you are the sacrifice and not the lamb. Now, some have suggested that he, he kept his reply to uh, Isaac relatively deliberately vague, purposefully opaque opaque that he essentially fudged the truth in verse 8 therefore he came out with a truism god himself will provide the land for the burnt offering my son and they point out these critics that abraham had not been averse before to employing half truths to his advantage but to my mind abraham really did believe that the lord would provide 
the lamb for the sacrifice. He really did believe somehow Isaac would return with him to the place where in verse 5 they had left the two servants and the donkey. Look at the, the pronouns. I hear a lot about pronouns these days. <laughs> but look at, look, at the, look at the pronouns that uh, Abraham uses in verse 5. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Not we will worship, but I will return, but we will return. Abraham was in the dark about certain things, certain things he didn't understand. He didn't understand God's purposes or God's providences, but he did know the righteous character of his God. And he did believe the promise that God had made that it would be through Isaac that his descendants would come. Now, this is how the author the, uh, of the letter to the Hebrews sees it. Hebrews 11. By faith, when God tested him, offered, uh, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Before the resurrection of the dead was spelt out in the New Testament, Abraham already believed it. Before Jesus was raised from the dead 2,000 years later, Abraham already believed it was within God's powers to bring his dear son back from the dead. Therefore, Abraham's reply in verse 8 was threefold. It was not only an expression of hope, but a declaration of faith that Isaac's life would be restored to him. But it was also unknowingly to Abraham a prophecy of the future salvation plan of God. The Lord would, in the fullness of time, provide the lamb for the atonement of sin. And that lamb would also be a son, but this time God's own son the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaac's question of verse 7 was ultimately answered then by John the Baptist in the opening chapter of John's Gospel. Do you remember that? The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The test, which Abraham must have found shocking, the question which he must have been dreading, and thirdly, verse 12, the vindication which Abraham must have felt heartwarming. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Quite when Abraham broke the news to Isaac that he was to be the sacrificial lamb, well, we're not told. But at some point, after reaching the place where the burnt offering was to be made, Abraham must have said to Isaac, son, you are the lamb. And one thing then becomes very clear. Abraham could not have offered Isaac without the son's consent and compliance. Abraham, by this time, was a centurion. He was the weaker of the two. It was Isaac who carried the wood up the mountain because as a 15-year-old, he was by far the stronger. As a young man, Isaac was also quicker and faster than his elderly father. After Abraham had told him that he was the one for sacrifice, Isaac could have taken to his heels and fled. But we read of no attempt of Isaac to escape. Instead, he appears to have been compliant. He appears to have co cooperated with his father. He allows himself to be bound. It seems Isaac trusted his father implicitly. It seems he had decided to obey his father whatever the cost, just as his father had decided to obey God, whatever the cost. Remarkably then, despite the extreme circumstances, the faith of the father was alive in the heart of the son. Thus, by the point of verse 10, 
in which Abraham has taken the knife to slit Isaac's throat, both father and son have accepted that this is God's will. Both may have been quaking with fear, but there could be no turning back. The will of God must be obeyed. There is nothing to be done then for, except for Abraham to do the grisly deed. But with knife in hand and with just a, a, a second or two to spare, the word of the Lord through the angel of the Lord comes to Abraham. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to harm him. We can only begin to imagine, can't we, the, the relief Abraham must have felt. It must have been the sort of relief a driver feels when from nowhere a small child runs out into the road, but the driver is able to slam on the brakes and bring the car to a shuddering halt just inches before it touches the child. The driver then gets out of the car to see if the child is okay, and he's shaking in relief, and he has his heart pounding. That was Abraham, shaking, sweating, and heart racing. But after a few moments of quiet reflection, with his heart also strangely warmed. His fear of God had been recognized by God. His faith in God had been vindicated by God. Now I know that you fear God. Abraham's faith had been put to the severest of tests, but had not been found wanting. Now I know that you fear God. You know, it's good to receive the recognition of your fellow Christians that you're a faithful brother or sister in Christ. It is good to be acknowledged in the church you belong to that you're a reliable church member. It is good if you've been unfairly criticised to be finally vindicated by others that you've acted honourably. But ultimately, there is only one vindication which matters. There is only one vindication which counts. And it's the Lord's. Now I know that you fear God. It is the Lord's well done, good and faithful servant. That is the only vindication we should be seeking. That is the only vindication we should be concerned to receive. After all the peaks and troughs of Abraham's amazing journey of faith, it was the vindication which must have warmed Abraham's heart. The test which Abraham must have found shocking, the question which Abraham must have been dreading, the vindication which Abraham must have felt heartwarming, and then lastly, the ram which Abraham knew must be Isaac's substitute. Verse 13, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. The angel of the Lord did not cancel the burnt offering. He did not call the whole thing off. He did not put the offering on hold indefinitely, just momentarily. The sacrificial offering would still take place. But who was to be sacrificed if not Isaac? And then the bleating of a ram came to Abraham's attention. The sound of a ram frustrated by its inability to free itself from a thicket. And instinctively, Abraham knew the lamb was to be slain in Isaac's place. The angel of the Lord did not need to say anything. There was no voice from heaven required to instruct him. Abraham just looked up and immediately he recognized Isaac's substitute. So Abraham went over to fetch it and sacrificed it to the Lord in his son's stead. And as a consequence, Abraham named that place Yahweh Yaira. The Lord will provide. Actually, the more literal translation of the Hebrew is the Lord will see to it. The Lord will see to it. Isn't that lovely? The Lord will see to it. 
And this is exactly what happened. The Lord had seen to it that Isaac would not die, but just at the right time, a sacrificial ram would be provided in his place. And here's the wonderful thing about the story. The Lord who tested, who had tested Abraham, was the same Lord who would see to it. The Lord who had tested Abraham was the same Lord who would provide. We learn that the, the God who tests is also the God who provides. The tester is the provider. Whenever God tests you, he will also provide for you. As God tests you and stretches you, as you cling on in faith, sometimes by your very fingernails, God provides. He provides the grace you need to bear up under the test. He is the God in the words of the hymn who gives more grace when the burdens grow greater. He is the God who sends more strength when the labors increase. Yahweh Yireh, the Lord will provide. The Lord will see to it. Well, we have then, don't we, by the end of chapter 22, reached a milestone in Abraham's amazing journey of faith. Not only in chapter 21 was I, uh, Abraham willing to let go of his son Ishmael, born of the flesh. Now in chapter 22, he was willing to let go of his son Isaac, born of the divine promise. It involved the test which Abraham must have found shocking, the question which Abraham must have been dreading, the vindication which Abraham must have felt heartwarming, the ram which Abraham knew must be Isaac's substitute. It teaches us that God can grow our faith through his testing to the extent that we can even hand over our own Isaacs to him. Just like Abraham had his Isaac, the dearest possession in the world to him, so do you and I have our own Isaacs. And our Isaacs may not be bad things at all. They may be very good things. It may be a, a, a relationship that we treasure. It may be a vocation that we flourish in. It may be a dream that we nurture for the future. God calls us through this passage to surrender our Isaacs to him and to trust him to be the Lord who provides. Yahweh Yireh. For the God who tests is the God who provides. But this passage is just so rich, isn't it, that we cannot fail to see that it's a preliminary pencil sketch of what would be the final and full picture 2,000 years later, when Christ would be the sacrificial lamb to take away the sin of the world. In Isaac's case, a ram died in his place. But in Jesus' case, nobody could take his place on the cross and be that atoning sacrifice for sin. In the case of the cross, it had to be the, the son and not the ram. Jesus was the metaphorical lamb, led to the slaughter who was pierced for our transgressions and by whose wounds we are healed. So we sing our final hymn in a moment, I will sing of the lamb, of the price that was paid for me, purchased by God, giving all he could give. Amen.